of existentialism and presently philosophical films for which he was awarded a certificate of excellence in teaching. Uh, he completed his studies in philosophy and English at Williams College, received his PhD in philosophy from Boston University, USA in 2014. Uh, his research is primarily focused on questions of how narrative is involved in how we understand our lives and constitute ourselves as full selves and persons. He is also developing an, in, uh, an interpretation of Heidegger's being and time as offering a novel theory of how we interpret the meaning of our lives. And this is my uh, favorite part. In the same way that we interpret a story, not when we finished, but rather when we are still in the middle of it. Very impressive, Dr. Rao. Uh, some of this work recently got published in uh, reputed journals. And right now, I believe he's working on papers uh, regarding resonance between Wittgenstein and number of contemporary American fiction writers, mainly on care, irony, commitment. Uh, he uh, also publishes fiction and popular criticism. And uh, before we uh, go on to listen to his lecture, I would quickly uh, just point out some of his notable and relevant publications here. One is on Wittgenstein, Lydia Davis, and other uncanny grammarians uh, that came out in philosophy and literature. Uh, one very interesting uh, piece, I believe, on how Sartre philosopher misreads Sartre novelist, Nausea and uh, the Adventures of the Narrative Self that came out in uh, a volume entitled Narrative, Philosophy, and Life. Uh, another article, Confessions, Excuses, and the Storytelling Self, Rereading Rousseau with Paul Dimon, uh, that came out in Rethinking European Politics and History. He has also co-edited a volume entitled Rethinking European Politics and History. And we are very fortunate to have him with us. Uh, today, his talk is entitled The Persistence of Existentialism in Later Literature. So keenly looking forward to your talk. Over to you, Dr. Roth. Very happy to be back. Thank you so much to Kalpana and Ritu for the invitation and for organizing. And thanks to the rest of you that have helped with organizing this great series and everyone else for, for attending. Um, so this talk, if you were here for my last one, is going to be um, organized very differently. So on, in the first talk, if you remember, I really focused closely on this one fairly short lecture by Sartre, Existentialism as a Humanism, and focused in particular on these, these philosophical ideas of where moral disagreement comes from um, and how we might think about moral disagreement. Um, today, I'm going to take a much broader view, and it's going to be much more on the literature side instead of the philosophy side. Um, so what I want to think about is um, why existentialism continues to persist, um, especially in literature, as it um, proliferates out beyond just France and uh, more recently than World War II and the post-World War II era when we, as what we think of as the kind of core time of existentialism. I think there's, there are many, many novels where we, that we would continue to describe as existentialists in some way um, and think about uh, why that is and where and when they occur. So I'm going to put a um, very simple slideshow up on the screen to talk through. Um, so most of what this is going to be is just um, to make sure that everyone can can see very clearly what authors and what books I'm talking about without me repeating the names and titles endlessly. Um, but I want to start off before I get to this more recent stuff just with the, the kind of assumed background of what are some of the kind of texts that we take to be absolutely core to literary existentialism with these post-World War II French writers. Uh, and then a few more uh, important forerunners of Sartre and de Beauvoir and Camus, people that wrote earlier than them that I also think are very important to these lines of influence and are gonna come back. Um, but then I'll really focus in on texts that are more recent than that. 
um, in a couple different places and eras. Um, and what my goal is to basically work toward an answer to the question, why does existentialism persist? And under what conditions? Where in the world, when in history does it seem most relevant? Okay, so um, to, just to start off with these, these, these very um, central texts, um, I take it that Sartre's novel Nausea is one of the absolute best places to start for thinking about literary existentialism. Um, so in particular, I think one of the things that's really interesting is that um, Sartre's novel Nausea comes out in 1938, um, which is actually years before his main philosophical treatise of the early part of his career being in nothingness. And it's really common for people to read nausea and being in nothingness in conjunction with each other. So frequently people will talk about nausea as being something like just an illustration of the major ideas of being in nothingness. And frequently that's the way people think of literary existentialism as being something just like a dramatized version of these philosophical ideas. Um, but that's to grant literature really a kind of secondary status to the philosophy. And I think the relationship between nausea and being in nothingness suggests right away why that's a kind of mistake, which is, and it's because nausea is actually written before being in nothingness. It's published five years before. And when you think of it that way, it would actually suggest that Nausea is the place where Sartre first thinks through some of his central ideas in this literary form within the density of a presentation of life in its, its full complexity. And then later he writes the treatise in the more abstract mode, extracting the pure philosophical ideas. So uh, I hope that a lot of you have uh, are familiar with nausea. There's this kind of story of Rocantine, who's a very disaffected young man um, who has gone to a fairly minor city, Booville, literally Mudville, and he's working on writing a biography of a fairly minor historical figure. Um, and there's not much in the way of actual plot in the novel. He kind of is going through a, a gentle crisis um, in which he's not sure that the way he's spending his time and writing this history is worth, worthwhile. He's worried that um, when, we, when we do history, we're actually just imposing form on the world that isn't actually there. But it heightens to this very dramatic experience of him, him, his kind of all of the conventions of life um, falling uh, to the side and even the kind of concepts that language imposes on the world falling aside. So he's, he has an experience of something like being in its raw form. Right. And um, so I think that if, you, if you're you looking for a starting place in existentialism, I said with the last lecture that um, I think existentialism as a humanism gives one of the most accessible overviews of Sartre's philosophical ideas. And I think this nausea is one of the, the best places to start with a literary text. Um, but Equally important to the development of early existentialism is Simone de Beauvoir. And she's now, I think, finally again getting credit for that. There was a very bad um, historical development in philosophy that even though Sartre and de Beauvoir were like in conjunction developing many of these ideas, um, Sartre really rose to prominence for a long time and people um, muted Simone de Beauvoir's uh, influence. And now though, I think at least um, in the, the American and British philosophical worlds, I think she's starting to get a lot more attention, deservedly. Um, I I'd, I'd go so far as to say, I think a lot of people actually think that Simone de Beauvoir now is a more interesting philosopher than Sartre and have paid a lot of attention to her work. Um, but you may know that Simone de Beauvoir, despite writing a lot of philosophical treatises, so especially The Second Sex, um, she actually identified primarily as a novelist. That's how she thought of herself, her writing persona. And I, her two most influential novels are her first one, She Came to Stay in 1943, uh, and then The Mandarins in 1954. So she came to stay uh, is written in the form of a kind of melodrama. Um, and it seems, it, it certainly reads to most people like a 
um, fictionalized version of her life and her relationship to Sartre, um, and then a, yet another young woman who was part of their circle. Um, but it's an especially good novel for thinking through the concept of being for others. So the way in which part of our identity and who we are is determined by the way other people see us and objectify us. Uh, and then the Mandarins is uh, is very much the story of Sartre, Camus, and Beauvoir. Again, fictionalized, um, but their um, kind of lives as part of the resistance in World War II. And then I singled out last time that I think that uh, this one short story, The Age of Discretion, which I believe you've all now gotten access to, um, is I think one of the best places for thinking about um, these issues of moral disagreement and where values come from. I think it does a great job of showing um, what happens when we put these very abstract ideas of existentialism into play with people who are in conflict with each other and complicated familial relationships with each other. And then finally, uh, I think you've heard a lot in this lecture series about Camus. Um, and I, I kind of, with these, with these three figures, my sense of what the most important texts are pretty much lines up with, I think, the literary consensus that the two books by Camus, two novels that really stand out to me as his best work, are The Stranger, also translated as The Outsider sometimes, and The Plague. Um, so at least in the United States, The Stranger is the one book that um, a lot of people and students are familiar with, that it's actually fairly commonly assigned in high school English classes here in the United States. So people get a, just a little taste of existentialism maybe through that. Um, and that's also, I think, one of the, the best places to get an introduction to uh, existentialism. And one thing that works so well with The Stranger as an introduction is it kind of, in a way it operates in both the literary and philosophical mode, because the first half of the story um, gives you this portrait of Merceau and his, his kind of ennui and disaffection in the world. Um, but then when he's in conversation late in the novel in prison with the priest, he has these, these quite long monologues um, about his thinking about um, God and religion, um, which, which almost serve as something like miniature philosophical treatises. And then the plague, of course, has become newly re-relevant in our times. I think a lot of you have probably seen a lot of um, literary critics have been writing reassessments of the plague in light of COVID-19. Um, so the plague is both this kind of story of uh, a particular bout of the plague in North Africa, but also very, very much readable as um, an allegory about resistance to fascism and the way that fascistic ideas spread through the world. And Camus uh, was very open to the idea that it was readable in these, these various different levels. Okay, so that's, I, again, this I take it to be very common background. Oh, and I'll just add one, one more text that I take to be core. So we could really, uh, quibble about what counts and doesn't count as existentialism. And famously, almost no one actually is comfortable being identified as an existentialist. That, um, so like Heidegger didn't consider himself an existentialist. Camus disavowed the label later in his life after his falling out with Sartre. Even Sartre was not so comfortable with this labor. So one, one thing uh, you could ask in this, as I progress through this series of texts, is there's always this question of how narrowly or broadly do we construe existentialism? So in starting off in the places where things we would almost all consider, but then I'll stretch it out to include other things. But just one last one I think most people would count as fairly core to existentialism is Beckett's play Waiting for Godot. Um, which I believe was first produced. It was written earlier, but first first produced as a stage play in 1953. Um, and uh, features these two characters who are kind of in this uh, undefined wasteland um, and just uh, constantly waiting, waiting for Godot. And so certainly this is interpreted maybe a little too heavily handedly for some, by some people as waiting for God. Um, there's other ways you could also interpret it. Um, but 
along with parts of the stranger i think waiting for Guido really gives us a sense of uh one version of existentialism's relation to religiosity um and how we can still continue to have this influence of religious thinking even as traditional religiosity has waned and a lot of people don't find accessible in the same way. Right. So this I think will also be relevant as a background to some of the other texts I get to. Okay, and then I wanna take a kind of, just a quick step backward and mention a few books before mid-century France that very much influenced the people I just talked about um, and will influence these some of these later texts that I'll focus on in greater length. Uh, so I think Dostoevsky would be core to any discussion of literary existentialism. And the text I would particularly point to is standing out Notes from Underground, um, which is this famous portrait of a completely disaffected, marginalized figure kind of writing from underneath society um, and is frequently read by people in conjunction with Nietzsche. Uh, crime and punishment. Also, I think some people take to to be uh, something you can very easily conjoin with Nietzsche, or also connect to this idea of the kind of um, superfluous act, or this idea of an action not being grounded in particular reasons, but kind of being spontaneous and standing apart from it. I um, mean, this is one of the things talked about with Sartre and existentialism as a humanism. This idea that uh, value—it's not that value creates action, but rather action creates value. So at the, at the bottom line of an existentialist analysis of value is this idea that it's our, our free choices that create value in the world. Um, and then also what most people consider Dostoevsky's greatest novel, The Brothers Karamazov. And one thing that I think is, is so interesting about The Brothers Karamazov, uh, so the, the story um, eventually revolves around this particular murder that has taken place. Um, and there's this question as to whether that murder has been uh, premeditated um, or it has been some sort of spontaneous action. And in American legal system and many legal systems, you know, there's a major distinction between those two things because the punishment is much greater for premeditated uh, action than spontaneous. But one of the things that the brothers Karamazov does is it actually really puts, when you read it and read this account of re and reconstruction of how the murder takes place, it puts enormous pressure on the idea that we can actually make a clear distinction between premeditated intentional activity and spontaneous activity. So there's one, um, very prominent scholar of Slavic literature, uh, Gary Saul Morrison, who has offered this concept of processional intentionality as a way of thinking about Dostoevsky. So it's the idea basically of thinking of intentionality as a process. Um, so, and, and it's not the idea that we, you know, we first reflect, think, decide, then will ourselves into action and act. Instead, it's the idea that uh, our very activity is a process that smears intentionality out into time. So it's actually, we don't necessarily have a crystal clear idea of what we intend or want to do and then realize it, but instead the very activity of, of starting to do something is something that starts to create and crystallize our intentions. And so we can't actually distinguish clearly between intentional and spontaneous action. And that's also something I'm gonna come back to with some of these more recent books. Uh, and then still within the great Russian figures, um, one of my favorite texts is uh, Tolstoy's The Death of Even Illich. Uh, so in particular, uh, this was a substantial influence on Heidegger uh, when he was writing the second part of Being in Time, where he talks about the, the notion of being towards death and the, the notion that it's um, a genuinely individualized awareness of the possibility of our own death 
that opens up the possibility of authenticity for an individual. That if we if we continue to obscure the fact that we will one day die, that is something that helps us escape into inauthenticity. Um, and so the death of Ivan Illich is this this story of of one uh, figure who um, f comes to understand that he really is going to die, that it is inevitable, it's in fact going to come quite soon, and then the, the quite radical effect that has on his thinking about the world and about how he should live in the remaining time that he has. So I'm actually going to be teaching the death of Ivan Illich uh, in a couple weeks in my philosophical films class, because um, we're going to be reading it in conjunction with um, Kurosawa's great film Ikiru, um, which takes the death of Il Ivan Illich and uh, adapts it to the, the heavily bureaucratized culture of post-World War II Japan. Um, and uh, recast Ivan Illich as a bureaucrat um, in city government in that culture. And again, he gets a, a, a diagnosis that he is going to die soon. And then we see um, the radical effects that has on how he's going to use the rest of his life. Okay, and then um, also very core forerunner of existentialism who you've heard a lot about in this series, Kafka. Um, and his his stories, um, and then the two novels that um, people focus on the most, The Trial and The Castle. Well, no, there's actually um, a bunch of new, or not new, but uh, previously kind of lost and inaccessible stories that are going to be published in English um, just in the next, I think, month or so um, that have been very difficult for people to get access to and are being published in a much wider edition now. Um, but Kafka, I think, what existentialists find of such interest in Kafka's thinking um, is this extremely distinctive and refined sense of absurdity Kafka has, that this kind of clash between the idea that uh, life feels um, deeply meaningful, but we don't know what that meaning is, that we can, can't pinpoint it. Or like in the, the basic plot of the castle, of K constantly trying to reach this goal of getting to the castle and it constantly eluding his his grasp. So that the kind of impossibility of the fulfillment of our deepest hopes and intentions, but at the same time, impossibility of altering or getting rid of those hopes and intentions. And then I really quickly, I just wanna add two more forerunners because these are ones that I think are gonna tied to some of these more recent texts that I'll focus on. So Andre Gide's The Immoralist um, was a major influence on the French existentialists. It's a story of a man who is kind of wandering through North Africa and struggling with the constraints of traditional morality and eventually throwing them off. So this is one of the books that um, people most commonly teach in conjunction with Nietzsche uh, because the immoralist uh, is this kind of figure who has gone beyond good and evil. So uh, this idea that is, the person has transcended traditional morality and no longer feels constrained by it. Um, and then one more American forerunner, one of the earliest of all these texts, uh, Herman Melville, author of Moby Dick. This is his uh, very short novella, Bartleby the Scrivener, um, in which a office clerk um, essentially opts out of society. So he keeps being asked to do particular tasks by his boss, and he keeps saying, I would prefer not to. Um, and just that becomes this kind of mantra, I would I prefer not to. Um, but what it, what's so fascinating, I think, and why people continue to be fascinated by this novella of Melville is there's just no explanation ever offered for why Bar Bartleby would prefer not to. That uh, when he gets, when he's kind of pressed within the story for an explanation, he just, it just kind of grounds out on that, I prefer not to. And that's even the text as a whole kind of interpreted in a literary way, it really resists any clear interpretation of what that is. And so it gives us this, I think, kind of very interesting portrait of, um, again, back to Sartre's ideas of where value comes from, 
of our kind of choices as this ground, groundless ground, right? So they, there's nothing that grounds them, but then they ground everything that come from it. And are so in, in a certain sense, kind of unanalyzable because what everything else is analyzed is in terms of those free choices we make. Um, but some of the texts I'm gonna talk about here now getting started will be a particularly kind of American version of existentialism's influence. And so I think, uh, Bartleby plays a real role on some of those. Okay, so the, the organizing question that I, I take for this talk is this, when does existentialism arise, reemerge, and seem most relevant? That's the overall question I wanna work towards an answer to. So I wanna start with a couple commonplace answers that are not exactly wrong, but also not, not very deep in their insight. So the first one, this is kind of a joke, but you could say the kind of glib answer to this question, when does existentialism arise and reemerge and seem relevant? The glib answer would be with every disaffected teenager. So this would be the idea that existentialism places this, this very central priority on, on um, anxiety um, and kind of malaise, ennui, this kind of falling out from normal cultural norms. Um, and in a way that those things are very similar to the kind of crisis that most teenagers go through at some point where they feel this kind of great weight and anxiety of their lives. It's kind of don't understand why things are the way they are, don't understand what they should be doing with themselves. And also it's, I think, in fact, empirically true that um, existentialism seems to be most appealing to people during a kind of teenage phase of their lives. And I, I think it's, it's, and this is true of me, I think it's frequently the case that when people continue to be interested in existentialism later, it's because it really got a grip on them in those teenage years when it seemed to be accessing um, feelings they had. But those feelings have continued to trouble me. And I think people that um, are interested in existentialism in a way that they don't for most people. So for most people, it's maybe a kind of brief phase and then you kind of grow out of it. Whereas I think for some people, this, these kind of questions of what, what is the meaning of anxiety? What is revealed when we kind of fall out of the traditional structure of significance? This can continue to bother some people for much longer. So again, I say this is this is kind of a half serious, half joking answer. But if we take this answer seriously, one thing it suggests is that existentialism will be perennially relevant because we'll always have a new batch of teenagers that are struggling through these same questions about how they should live and what their relation to traditional uh, morality and cultural norms should be. But it also suggests this flip side that um, even if those those gener each new generation of teenagers finds it relevant, it's going to be dismissed by professional philosophers because most of the professional philosophers have aged out of these concerns and issues and look back on them perhaps somewhat condescendingly and dismissively. And I think if we, if, if we take the very big picture of the Anglo-American philosophical world, I think this is something this is actually a fairly accurate portrait, which is that um, existentialism continues to be taught in just about every philosophy department at American universities, for example. Um, and it's the reason why it's taught is primarily because it's, it's usually a quite popular course with um, American college students who are 18, 19, 20 years old. But at the same time, um, they're then not all that many courses uh, beyond a kind of one existentialism course at most colleges, like an advanced seminar on Sartre would be pretty unusual in most um, colleges now, um, or um, a full class on Camus or something like that. Um, and also then I take it that uh, there are just not that many Anglo-American philosophers whose own work and publications focus on existentialism. It's viewed as a quite marginalized area within philosophy. Um, and so it's kind of, with this first answer, this idea that it'll be relevant to people, but not to people who have dedicated themselves professionally to philosophy. 
Okay, and then um, my second kind of initial answer, and I think I think this is the kind of standard answer most people would give you, and that I'm going to seek to refine a little bit with my examples. But the standard example: when is when does existentialism arise? When um, does it reemerge or seem most relevant? Would be um, it has something to do with times of cultural upheaval. So first, we just notice that, in fact, this, the core figures that we would take to be existentialists all exist in extremely um, uncertain times, times of change. So Kierkegaard and Nietzsche are perhaps the two great philosophers of the wane of religiosity and the rise of secular modernity. Um, so exists at this time where the traditional ways of organizing life in Western Europe are collapsing um, and where people are struggling to figure out how to create new ways of organizing life. Um, and of course, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche go in quite different directions than where Kierkegaard tries to kind of recover a true notion of religiosity, whereas Nietzsche kind of um, paves the way toward a post-religious time. And then a kind of generation later, um, we have Heidegger, who comes of age um, during World War I, um, and then that is middle-aged and complicit with the rise of Nazism. Um, and then finally, most centrally, Starcher, Beauvoir, and Camus uh, essentially come out of World War II. And the upheavals of World War II and their um, interactions with the resistance in World War II. So one thing you might think this suggests is that um, there's some sort of at least correlation, even causal structure at work here, and that be, existing in this historical times of great upheaval um, leads one to these existentialist concerns or leads one, one later back to these existentialist concerns um, because those, uphe those upheavals all have the shape of either putting pressure on or collapsing the prevailing structures of meaning and the prevailing practices that organize people's lives. Um, and so bring us back to these basic questions of, okay, how should we organize our lives? What should we value um, that existentialism makes central? So the first book um, I wanna talk about in just a little more detail um, as you see, uh, the way I've organized this, I'm moving quite quickly through a lot of books. And in part that's because, especially as I move into these new ones, I take it that most of you will not yet be familiar with a lot of these books, won't have read them. And what my kind of greatest hope for this lecture is that um, I'll give you a lot of possible leads on things to read. So I really hope that just a, a couple, you come away from this with a couple of things that maybe you had vaguely heard of or uh, maybe hadn't heard of at all uh, that really sound intriguing and you'll go off after this lecture and track down some of these books and read them. So since I'm assuming that you're not enormously familiar with most of these texts. I don't think it would make sense for me to descend into an extremely detailed interpretation of them. Um, you need time to, to actually read the text. Um, instead, what I want to do is just give you an introduction to them and suggest um, some intriguing connections between these texts and existentialist thinking that if you do go read them, you could start to think through in more detail. Um, so this first one is Dino Bazzotti's The Tartar Step, an Italian novel from 1940. So it was written a couple of years before that. I think it was written in 1938. So it was written basically right before uh, the start of World War II. Um, and then it was published during World War II and published in particular exactly in between the publication dates of Sartre's Nausea and Camus' The Stranger. One was two years before, one was two years after. So it's right at that time where literary existentialism is starting. And um, if any of you have seen, one, one thing I created um, in doing some of my criticism is this kind of flow chart to recommend philosophical novels. I mean, I find it pretty easily on the internet. Um, but there's just a kind of a uh, half serious resource to help um, students and other readers to uh, go find a philosophical novel that sounds especially intriguing to them. 
Um, but I actually, on that flow chart, I singled out this book, The Tartar Step, as what I think is the the most underrated philosophical novel of all time. So I think it. We, this is a novel we should think of uh, as highly as The Brothers Karamazov or The Death of Ibn Illich or um, The Stranger or Nausea. But at least in the United States, is an extremely obscure book. I very rarely meet anyone who um, has heard of it or read it. Um, I think in, in Europe and Italy in particular, it's a little bit more familiar. But the basic story of the Tartar Step is there is a, a newly commissioned soldier Drogo, um, who has finished his training, and his first posting is to an extremely obscure backwater fortress um, on the edge of a northern desert. And um, it's kind of vaguely suggested that maybe this fortress was once important in the past, um, but, but now it's very much suggested it's an unimportant place. It's a place where kind of people go off and um, uh, have their careers derailed because it's so unimportant. Um, and so he goes goes to this fortress. It overlooks a desert where there's this kind of vague worry that um, there might be invading Tartar hordes from the north that will come down someday. But there's never actually been any sign that this is happening. Um, and he goes off there with the goal of being reassigned and going reassigned to the city as quickly as possible. Um, but then he ends up staying there essentially his whole life. So he keeps kind of, the reassignment keeps getting deferred. He keeps kind of finding a reason to stay at the fortress. And one of just the, the real formal achievements of this novel is that um, it somehow very plausibly makes you feel that he could do this, that as much as he wants to leave, he could stay there his entire life. And so it opens up into this allegory of why do we spend our entire lives not doing the things that we actually claim to ourselves are the things that are most important and we want to do? Why do we procrastinate our entire lives from the things that we actually think we should be doing? Um, and I won't, I won't uh, give away the ending, but he, he's he set off on this track where he seems to then be spending his entire life at this fortress. There's some, some ties that I particularly stress with this novel is that clear connections to Sartre's ideas of bad faith. So one of Sartre's central examples of bad faith is the soldier playing the role of the soldier. Um, and that's very much these, everyone at this fortress is um, you know constantly going through these changing of the guards and standing at attention, even though there doesn't seem to be any reason for it. There's not any actual threat. And this ties to Camus, this idea that uh, of kind of existing within a larger structure of meaning, even though we can't verify that meaning. And uh, Drogo is um, you know, existing within this militarized sense of life and how things are organized, but can't actually explain like why that makes sense. Right? Uh, but in particular, I see the enormous Heideggerian connections to the Tartar step. So one of Heidegger's distinctions in being in time is between two different orientations toward the future. There's awaiting the future, um, which is the inauthentic orientation to it, versus expecting the future, which is the authentic. And so in particular, authentic orientation towards the future for Heidegger is being towards death. Um, and that is what allows us to individualize our existence and possibly achieve authenticity. Um, but there's one of the important sources for Heidegger's notion of authenticity is Kierkegaard. And one of Kierkegaard's claims is that the night of faith is in no way identifiable from the outside. So that's a suggestion that authenticity doesn't actually bring or necessarily bring any sort of overt changes in a person's life. It could be an entirely internal sense, uh, reorientation towards doing the same things you do and living in the same way. And so on a first reading, the Tartar step, I think the obvious reading that presents itself is that Drogo is trapped in inauthenticity in a kind of bad faith. Um, and that, uh, 
if he could achieve authenticity, he would leave the fortress. He would finally go do the things that he wants to do with his life. Um, but actually on a kind of second reading, especially in light of these Heideggerian and Kierkegaardian ideas, uh, one thing we might think is that um, if Drogo did achieve authenticity, it might not actually change his life in any way. So it could be that authenticity is merely a, a reorientation towards one's existence as it already is. And so that could even open up the question of um, maybe Drogo could leave a completely authentic existence kind of trapped at this fortress without changing anything about it. Okay, and then um, that's to just add one text from this core era of mid uh, 20th century Europe to this list of existentialist novels. Then I want to hop forward. So if we take it as this um, this operating hypothesis that existentialism is important during times of upheaval, kind of some of the greatest upheavals, so especially since World War II um, in Western culture took place in the 1960s. And so a whole bunch that I'll just move through really quickly here. So another Italian novel, um, Alberto Moravia's Boredom. So not necessarily a novel I think that most people talk about as tied to existentialism, um, but it's this portrait of a character really ex um, uh, experiencing a kind of bourgeois malaise of having nothing in particular that he needs to do with himself. And so, you know, a sense of what he should do with himself and be enters into these kind of obsessive relationships with various things. Um, but in particular, it's, it's, I think, interesting because boredom is another concept that does not generally get uh, much philosophical attention, um, but actually is been, has uh, been analyzed in a really interesting way by certain existentialist philosophers. So in particular, um, one of Heidegger's lecture series, The Fundamental Concepts of Metaphysics, offers this very detailed account of boredom and different kinds and levels of boredom and the idea that actually um, philosophy corresponds to a certain very deep kind of boredom where you actually have to allow um, the normal meanings and connections between things to fall away to see things more essentially. Um, another another author who is talked about quite often in relation to existentialism is the Japanese novelist Kobo Abe. Um, so two of his books that I consider the, the best and most interesting are The Woman in the Dunes and The Face of Another, both from the 60s. So Kobo Abe in particular read a lot of uh, Kafka and Husserl and Heidegger. He actually was not, not super interested in Sartre. Um, but The Woman in the Dunes is a story of um, a kind of hobbyist entomologist, so a guy who spends his free time collecting and studying insects, and he goes to um, the shore and these the stretch of sand dunes to try to find a particular kind of beetle. Um, and he ends up becoming trapped there, and in particular trapped in a, a woman's house that is surrounded by high sand dunes on all on all sides so that he's unable to escape. And he spends all he has to spend all of his time essentially digging the house out from the sand that it keeps collapsing on the house and he has to keep digging it away. Um, but it's a novel that's I think very productively thought about in conjunction with Kafka and this and, and also also Camus. So the this kind of sense of a, the absurdity of existence of uh, being trapped in um, these same uh, repetitive Sisyphean activities. Um, and then the face of another is the story of a scientist who, in some of his experiments, um, uh, has an accident and suffers extremely bad burns on his face. And so now sets himself the new scientific task of concocting um, as realistic a, a mask or a facial prosthesis mm -hmm. as he can. Um, and succeeds in creating this face. So 
uh, in parts of the novel, he's moving around totally bandaged to cover his face. But then once he develops the mask and wears that, um, he the, the mask makes him look quite different than he used to look. And a kind of fascinating idea at the heart of the novel is that he, it actually transforms his personality. And so this is a, another place where I think if you want to think about the existentialist concept of being for others, this notion that part of who we are is how we are objectified and seen by other people. Um, the idea is that because he's seen by other people differently, with the mask on, he actually is a different person. And so putting the mask on changes, fundamentally changes his personality in some way. Okay. Uh, and then an American novel from the 60s, The Movie Goer by Walker Percy. So something, uh, this is a novel set in the American South in New Orleans and um, Walker Percy is in particular extremely influenced by Kierkegaard. Um, and so if you want to think about Kierkegaard and religious existentialism in a more literary mode, I think this is one of the best novels to do it. So it starts from an epigraph of um, the, the precise nature of despair is that it's unaware of itself as despair. And on the face of it, the moviegoer is a much more lighthearted novel than a lot of these. So one, one thing that uh, is true of a lot of existentialist novels is they can feel extremely dark and overwrought and overbearing. So this is especially true of like nausea. Um, it seems to be this portrait of an extremely discontented, depressed man moving through a dark and foggy landscape um, and everything is very heavy and murky. The, the moviegoer, at least initially, is actually a very light and comic novel. So it's a story of an absurdly titled character, Binks Balling, who, um, is lives a quite comfortable existence in the suburbs of New Orleans. He works as a stockbroker, um, and despite that, he he still experiences this kind of existential crisis where the importance or significance of everything that he's doing um, has really fallen away. He no longer knows why he's living, making the choices he's making. Um, but unlike a lot of these novels, he there's, there's much more of a religious influence in the question, uh, in particular, of his relationship to traditional Southern culture. So in, in New Orleans is one of the few places in the South because of... Um, the influence of French immigration has a much more substantial Catholic population um, and uh, how that influences his thinking. So uh, the concept that emerges in the movie goer is that of the search and that being spalling is constantly on the search and, but it's left indeterminate. What is that search for? So is it kind of straightforwardly the search for something like the meaning of life or how to live or the search for God? Um, and it follows his then um, developments there. But I think really interesting connections both to Kierkegaardian ideas um, uh, about the kind of leveling effects of modern culture, this idea that everything exceptional has to be kind of tamped down within modern culture to um, promote equality of some kind. Um, but also really interesting connections to uh, this one Kierkegaard essay that I think is one of the best introductions to Kierkegaard um, titled on the, the difference between a genius and an apostle. And, and in that text, Kierkegaard is comparing the way in which you would really read a religious text when you take it to be the words of an apostle or an a prophet. So basically, if you read this text, taking it to be some some sort of conduit to the divine or the voice of God, versus if you read a religious text, uh, when you take it to be the work of a genius, so an, an aesthetic genius, an artist, and you take it that what they've done is create an artistic achievement. So one of the, the interesting things Kierkegaard argues for is that you can't actually take a text as both of those things, that those are actually contrary Stand, interpretive stances. So one, I think that the best example of this is you can think about the book of Job, um, which is another thing we could think of as an existentialist text. Um, so there's one book from the Old Testament, um, the, the story in which God and the devil make a bet as to whether um, this very pious believer Job can be shaken out of his faith 
when the devil takes away everything, uh, all of his wealth and his family and everything that he cares about. So on one hand, we can read the book of Job as a religious text, take it as written by an apostle, a prophet. And then we're very much interpreting it for what is, what is God saying via um, his human actors in this text? Or you could take it as written by an artist. And, and many people will read the book of Job just in a literature class, utterly apart from any um, particular religious beliefs and just read it as this dense text of thinking about the relationship between prosperity and the good life. Um, and for Kierkegaard, there's this absolute clash between those two stances. Okay, and then one, one more American one I wanna add. Um, this is a book that uh, has really been rediscovered in the Anglo-American world in the last uh, five to 10 years, um, Stoner by John Williams. Um, it had been a very obscure book for a long time, but then people um, started to reread it recently. And um, this is a very academic novel in the sense that its, its main character, Stoner, is uh, a lifelong English professor. Um, but it's this very quiet, meditative story of his life um, and struggles within the academic realm. And in particular, his kind of the way in which certain higher up colleagues of his have kind of inhibited the possibility of him rising in the academic ranks. Um, but I think it, this novel very quietly achieves a particular American kind of existentialism. Um, and it, it shows Stoner is just leaving this kind of quietly, des both desperate, but at the same time, kind of purposeful life where he's found this one corner that's kind of not only apart from society, but he also it ultimately has to be kind of apart from even uh, academic, his academic department and what's centrally going on there. And, and quietly um, through his own um, persistent valuing of certain things, creating a life worth living apart from um, what tradition says in a lot of ways. So this is one to you where I think that uh, Melville and this figure of Bartleby and kind of opting out of certain things in life hovers as an important background. Okay, and then the next one I wanted to talk about in a little more detail for you is an Austrian novel from 1963 called The Wall. Um, so, uh, this is another book I think is a fantastic novel that very few people I've ever met have heard of or read it. I think it's somewhat well known within the German speaking world, but beyond that, my impression is that very few people are familiar with it. Uh, so this is a kind of uh, dystopian, on one reading, a kind of dystopian science fiction novel. So it's, it's the story of a woman who is in uh, a fairly isolated valley, uh, an isolated valley at the edge of the Alps. Um, when some sort of catastrophe ensues. Uh, and what she essentially finds is that she has been uh, boxed into this valley by some kind of invisible wall. So the one road that kind of leads out of it, she eventually just kind of runs into this invisible wall. Uh, and she can see on the other side of the wall that everything seems to just have become frozen in a certain way. Um, but she can't communicate across it. She has no idea if anyone even is alive on the other side anymore. And so it's never really explained, but it's quietly suggested that um, there's maybe there's been some sort of nuclear event or this wall is some sort of uh, weapon that someone attacking uh, Europe has deployed or attacking within Europe has deployed in some way. But what's I think really interesting about the novel is that there's, there's a very high concept kind of science fictional idea, but that's just like very quietly in the background is the setup. But then the entire novel focuses on the fact that she is alone in this hunting lodge in this one valley. And the entire novel is basically just her crafting a life for herself and figuring out how to survive by herself. So she finds a cow 
Um, and she, she has a, enough kind of potatoes and beans that she's able to plant uh, a larger crop for next year. She kind of forages for food and hunts occasionally deer and fishes in the stream. She, she leads this life of kind of constant work where she just has to constantly um, work in order to produce firewood and um, hay for the cow to eat and food for herself to eat. And so some of the existentialist themes that I emerge in this, one, uh, the traditional way this novel is read is as a feminist novel, um, because it's this one woman who is, is left by herself, but to left to in this very male narrative. So normally survivalist narratives like um, Robinson Crusoe are um, paradigmatically these male narratives or one man left by himself and said it's this one woman left in that kind of situation. And within that, within a feminist reading, I think you could very easily read this as a specifically Beauvoirian story. So there's literally no men present, um, but it still leaves this question of to what extent kind of male conceptuality continues to define things. Um, and it's also this very interesting investigation of um, being for others again. So this, to what extent is the, the narrator of the wall still defined by the way other people see her, even though there's no one left to see her? So it's the way she's still defined by the way she thinks other people see her. Um, but also the, the animals emerge very interestingly in this role in the story that she has, as you can see on this, this cover here, she has a dog with her who becomes the kind of main second character in the book and her companion. Um, there's again, I think, really interesting Heideggerian connections in this novel uh, that uh, it, it sets up these very big big distinctions between um, the rural or traditional way of life versus um, the city and modernity and technology. And this distinction between the way time is normally governed for us by clocks, um, whereas in the novel, it's the clocks all break and stop working. And so it's instead time is governed by nature and the rising and the setting of the sun and the changing of the seasons and the difference between stormy weather and good weather. Um, but I think the Heideggerian thing that most interestingly I wanna focus on is that Heidegger offers this account of uh, where significance comes from. And in his analysis, there's significance always exists within this larger structure that we're doing any immediate activity for the sake of some other activity, for the sake of some other activity. And then what Heidegger points out is that ultimately that is for the sake of being itself. That's why um, we do anything at all. And what what I think very distinctively happens in this novel is that whereas normally that's a heavily mediated structure with lots of intermediary steps, so many of those intermediary steps in this are cut away and no longer present. And so in particular, we can notice how um, so many of the things that we do, we do for the sake of making money so that we can use that money to do something else. And just by taking out that intermediary step, money has no role when this one woman is trapped by herself. Um, it creates those kind of ultimate ends become much closer to her. And so there'd be this idea that by extracting a lot of those intermediary steps, it makes much plainer what finally actually matters in existence. Okay, I'm, I've got a few more to go through. Um, I don't have quite as much time, so I'll be a little quicker with these last few. Um, but we've now gotten to the point where we can see that the first part of my kind of slightly uh, refined answer to the question has emerged. So why, when does existentialism arise, reemerge, seem most relevant? The first part of my own answer would be that it's not just in historical moments of cultural upheaval, but in historical moments when the struggle for freedom is prominent and palpable, but not so dire as to obscure matters of dignity. So the texts that I would say really most clearly point in this direction and you could really think through. One would be just about everything written by Richard Wright, um, American writer from the South. So I think the two books that most productively read 
um, in conjunction with existentialism are his autobiography, Black Boy, which is about growing up black in um, the segregated South. And what's really remarkable about this book is that um, unaware at that point of larger existentialist ideas through his analysis of his own experience growing up in segregation, Wright basically comes to many of the same concepts that Sartre and Beauvoir and Camus did. And then he would eventually, um, he would eventually move to Paris um, and be friends with Sartre and Beauvoir. Um, and then really start reading all of that stuff explicitly. And so one of his later novels, The Outsider, um, is a book that uh, I think is very productively read in particular in conjunction with Nietzsche. So it's again, this, this, I, this sort of novel where a figure has uh, escaped or transcended traditional morality. So in particular, this, this, the setup for that book, The Outsider, is that the main character, um, uh, everyone thinks he has died in a subway accident. And so he just walks away from his life um, because everyone thinks that he's now dead. And so in metaphorically dead, he's then able to kind of recreate his life as he wants to apart from traditional morality. Um, and the, a lot of Wright's books, I think, very productively also read in conjunction with Franz Fanon. Sorry, I've actually misspelled that. There should be a T within Franz Fanon's first name there. Um, his, uh, his book, Black Skin, White Masks. Um, and I think Fanon is someone that um, is getting an enormous amount of attention in philosophy and the art world. Um, right now, and is someone that I think that we should really view as a central existentialist philosopher, um, along with Sartre and de Beauvoir and Camus, and in particular the philosopher of what does ex existentialism look like, um, not to white Europeans, but instead to marginalized populations. So black skin, white masks, thinking through what it is to be uh, viewed as black by society. And then the last great text of his, um, The Wretched of the Earth, which is about colonialism and, and how to decolonize. Right? And that's a book then to make the transition that is very fruitfully read in conjunction with Camus Daoud's The Merceau Investigations. So Daoud is a Algerian journalist um, and he published this novel, The Merceau Investigation, in 2013, which is essentially a rewriting of The Stranger um, from the perspective of the colonized population. So as many of you know, The Stranger takes place in North Africa, um, but that Merceau is um, part of the colonial population. So he comes, his lineage is tracked back to France. And um, one of the very infamous critical charges against the stranger is that um, in that book, Merceau eventually commits a murder, um, but the victim of his murder is never named. So he's just referred to as the Arab in the book. Um, and then when Merceau is put on trial, uh, remarkably, it doesn't seem to be the fact that he's committed a murder that bothers the prosecutors or the jury. And instead, the focus comes much to be much on the fact that uh, Merceau's mother had died, but Merceau had never cried at the funeral or didn't seem bothered or didn't really mourn her. And so again, this, there's this charge by some critics that the novel um, com marginalizes the colonial population. And so one thing Kamel Daoud is doing in writing this book is he's kind of reclaiming that story from the position of the colonized population. So it's written from the perspective of the brother of the man that was killed by Merceau, and it gives him a name. His name is Musa in the novel. Um, but it's also, I think, a little more complicated than that because, um, so it, one way you can read it then is it's just this, it's this post-colonial rebuttal to a, the charge that the stranger is racist by obscuring its colonial context and ignoring its coloni the colonized 
figures in this story. But at the same time, the Merceau investigation is also an homage to the stranger. So it's written very much in the same kind of language as the stranger, to the point that by the end of the book, um, the narrator starts to actually say many of the same sentences that are used in The Stranger. So it's it's totally steeped in, in the language and story of The Stranger. Uh, but one other thing, uh, mention this very briefly, in addition to being a rebuttal to The Stranger, I take it that the Merceau investigation is also a stranger to this, there's one uh, very bad tendency that exists in some of these novels. So before, way up above, I mentioned The Immoralist by Andre Gide. Another book we could mention here is Paul Bull's The Sheltering Sky. So I think these are both great books. But they also do this thing where they're both complicit with a kind of Orientalism, where they present North Africa as this kind of site for um, the wanderings of disaffected Europeans and Americans. So North Africa is essentially presented as this place where like these white Westerners have come to escape the traditions of their culture. And by doing that, they end up um, kind of fetishistically uh, othering and orientalizing North African culture. So I think that another thing that uh, the Merceau investigation is doing is kind of writing back against that tendency within um, certain uh, European novels set in North Africa. Okay, and then, um, uh, the second part of my answer, and this is where, what I'll finish up with, is that that was very quickly to focus on um, existentialist novels where the struggle for freedom is really palpable. The second part of my answer is essentially the flip side of that. Um, and remember that whenever we're talking about freedom in existentialism, we're also talking about responsibility. So freedom is not the freedom to do anything whatsoever unconstrained because it always comes with it the responsibility of enacting and creating certain values and also representing those values is not merely your own preferences but is having universal value of some kind and so the flip side of focusing on the struggle for freedom is to focus on complicity with the um, restriction on freedom. And so here I'm saying that in historical moments when complicity with the denial of freedom is prominent and palpable. And here also I think it's really important to say not just the freedom of others, but also one's own. So the focus in these last few bits stories and novels I'm going to talk about is especially this. What is these novels I think emerge when people are worried that they're complicit with their own unfreedom. So the idea that um, they're not taking responsibility for their own free possibilities, but actually inauthentically rejecting that. So one short story that I think is a great way place to think through that through this is called Good Old Neon. Um, by David Foster Wallace, the American writer. It was published in his collection, Oblivion. Um, and this is the this, this story written from the perspective of a character who uh, views himself as essentially fraudulent. So he thinks in, in these existentialist terms, he kind of looks inward and asks, what is my essence? And he concludes that he's essentially a fraud, that basically everything he does is merely to create an image for other people of a person that he wishes he were, or they wish he were, but that he's not, he doesn't actually have anything inside him. He's this kind of emptiness um, that's always playing a role for other people. So it's this kind of extremely hyper-conscious, self-conscious notion of bad faith, where you know you're in bad faith, but feel like everything you do remains in bad faith. There's no escaping it in any way. Um, and then another book that I think uh, is one of the great kind of post-existentialist novels Remainder by Tom McCarthy. Uh, this was written in 2005. Um, and it got its, it, he kind of struggled to get it published initially. So it, it was first published by uh, a very small art book press, but then it really caught on and achieved this cult status, was republished by a bigger publisher and won awards and got many more readers. Uh, but Remainder is the story of a man who 
suffers a serious head injury, um, which escape erases most of his memory. But he also, because of this accident, receives a huge financial settlement, um, which basically allows him to do anything he wants to do. But what he chooses to do with his money is that one day he experiences this this flash of memory and deja vu of a time when he felt authentic. So when he felt he was kind of fully present in his body and his life and moving fluidly through the world. And so what he does then is he spends all of his money to try to recreate that memory. So he, he remembered himself as being in an apartment building with uh, a neighbor below him that's endlessly cooking liver, another neighbor who's practicing the piano, another neighbor who's out in the yard tinkering with his motorcycle. And so he literally buys an apartment building, has it renovated into the shape of his memory, and then hires actors to occupy the roles of these people that he remembers doing these different things. And so it becomes this, this extremely convoluted meditation on authenticity because on the face of it, what he's doing is the most inauthentic thing possible, like literally acting all the time. But it's for the sake of reachieving a feeling of authenticity. So it suggests in this, in a very kind of postmodern way that um, if authenticity is to be achieved, it's not going to be simply, but it's instead going to be through inauthenticity. And so one of the things in particular I think is so fascinating about this novel, um, and this connects back to Heidegger and to what I was talking about in the brothers Karamazov about uh, intentional versus spontaneous activity, is that uh, there's this question and remainder of um, how, how conscious or self-conscious are we in most of our actions, right? When we are kind of moving through the world, are we doing that um, kind of knowing what we're doing and intentionally doing our activity? Or is it mostly a matter of habit and kind of automatic behavior? Um, and really, those are big questions in Heidegger and in this account of intentionality in Dostoevsky. And here we get this very kind of um, postmodern version of it in McCarthy. Okay, and then just last few. I know I'm running over on time here, so I'll be quick. Um, another novel to think about um, in connection with existentialism is Alexander Maxick's You Deserve Nothing from 2011. Um, so on the face of it, this is the story of a young teacher in Paris, and he's literally teaching Sartre and existentialism to a group of high school students. So uh, it gives you this kind of portrait of ex the existentialist teacher. Um, but then uh, as the story develops, the teacher has an affair with an, a student. And so I think then the next kind of level of reading is it's this kind of test of existentialist morality that um, on the one hand, we, we would all view this relationship as immoral on the part of the teacher. But at the same time, if we're thinking of, of morality in terms of existentialism, it, it asks us to think there's no such thing as a priori morality, university morality, but it's always located in particular situations. But then I think where this becomes most fascinating as a place of thinking about existentialism is that when this book came out and started to achieve some success, um, some people did some important reporting that revealed that Maxick had a lot of the stuff in the book was thinly based on his own life. And so in particular, he um, had uh, been accused of having an affair with one of his own students when he was teaching uh, in Paris earlier in his life. And in particular, the reporting suggested that the way that relationship is construed in the novel was not true, that he kind of mis mis represented the relationship as viewed from the other side of it. And so here's what I think becomes very fascinating is that that suggests that the entire novel as a novel itself becomes an act of bad faith because it becomes this false rationalization on the author's parts, on the author's part for 
bad behavior in his own past. And so I think this is incredibly complicated interplay. And I don't even know how intentional we would, we would claim that this is on Max 6 part between what's happening within the story and then the way that we interpret that as a um, work of artifice and perhaps a misleading work of artifice as a novel. Okay, and then just the last one um, I want to focus on is uh, My Heart Hemmed In, a 2007 novel by uh, the French writer Marie Najaye. Um, so Marie Najaye is someone who, at least in the U.S., is just now kind of starting to break through and become well-known. But in France, she's a huge name and has won kind of all of the major awards in France. Um, and I would not, I would not generally say that Marie Najai's novels are existentialist. Like most of them are read, um, especially through feminism um, and other theoretical apparatuses. But I think this book in particular um, has really interesting connections to existentialism. Um, so this is the the story of uh, a couple of married teachers. Um, who regard themselves as extremely kind of good and professional, inspiring teachers. But one day they find that their community has just kind of turned against them. They're now like scorned by everyone around them. Everyone just kind of scowls or swears at them. And then most dramatically, the husband um, gets some kind of wound that's growing in his abdomen. And it's unclear if he's literally attacked by some people at some point, or if actually the very kind of uh, hatred of these people of him is actually kind of creating this wound in him. So a lot of the novel operates in this very um, kind of dreamlike logic or Kafkaan logic where it could be that the very thoughts of other people are causing this physical harm to him. Um, and so one, one way you can read it as, as this portrait of um, entitlement. So they, they have, this couple has um, thought of themselves very highly. And I think one thing you can read is it suggests that like, so long as they continue to think of themselves that way, they had that status. But as soon as there was like a slight slip in it, then um, not only did they stop thinking of themselves that way, but they literally lose it. So this idea that their kind of status is a fiction that they create in some way. Um, but also this idea that, uh, of, as a portrait of being for others. So again, this idea that the, the gaze of the other, the way that other people look at us, help creates who we are. And in this case, um, this idea that this uh, scornful gaze of the community actually transforms who, who they are and creates this kind of physical wound in him. But then just the final little reading that I wanna sketch before finishing here is of this novel as, um, offering this particularly fascinating conception of questions of race and identity in connection with existentialism. So one, one thing that emerges, as a lot of critics have pointed out when you're reading this book, is that it's very quietly, but also ambiguously suggested that Nadja, the, the main character, the narrator of the novel, um, is not white. So there's a bunch of these quiet suggestions that where people start talking, referring to people like you. And she keeps saying like, what are you talking about? People like me, like teachers, or what do you mean? Um, but then it's eventually suggested um, through a couple other clues that, so her, her granddaughter is named Suhar, which is presented as this very Arabic sounding name. And that really bothers Nadja that her son, who she's kind of lost communication with, has given this Arabic sounding name Suhar to his daughter. She kind of suggests that this will make her granddaughter's love hard in some way. And finally, late in the novel, they seem the novel's location seems to shift from, from France, uh, specifically to Corsica, um, and into... Uh, a population where there's there's a large North African immigrant population in Corsica, and so when you when it's and all of this is very ambiguous and quiet, so it's hard to kind of offer a certain interpretation. But one thing I take this to read as is as a kind of investigation into what in existentialist terms we would call the bad faith of race denial. So it's this portrait of a woman who, if we think that she is actually from North Africa, has 
so thoroughly committed herself to um, integrating with French culture that she has repressed her own ethnic background. And the, the, what it appears to be the case then is that this novel was set right in this period, early 21st century, where there's enormous Western European anxieties and discrimination emerging against refugees and other immigrants that are moving from the Middle Eastern world and North African world across the Mediterranean into Western Europe. So I think that's how we can kind of understand this, this idea of why is a community turning against them? Because they're kind of prejudices against uh, non-white French population have been activated by these stories of refugees. And so then now these are being leveled against nausea. And so I think that the, the final claim that would really add up as a, um, a kind of epigraph for this novel would be Simone de Beauvoir's claim in the introduction to the second sex, where she says that denial of race and gender is not a liberation for the people that are oppressed by those concepts, but rather an inauthentic flight. And so Beauvoir's suggestion in the introduction to the second sex is that if we just operated without notions of race and gender, that wouldn't actually create equality between all of us. It would instead uh, lead to like yet more inauthenticity because these concepts would continue to have an influence on people and would ten continue to be employed prejudicially, but we would no longer be able to explicitly thematize how that's happening. And so the way that I read this novel through this very particular interpretation is it's a portrait of a woman who is herself tried to forget that she's a woman and that she is has North African ethnicity um, and the, the kind of the way in which that doesn't allow her to escape the prejudices of the people around her, but actually kind of gives them even more power than they had before. Okay, so I've gone way over on time, um, but I just to, to sum up then, uh, on the one side I've suggested that um, Books like Richard Wright's Black Boy and Camille Dude's The Merceau Investigation can really help us think about where there's kind of new existentialist novels being written from the side of people fighting for freedom. On the flip side, some of these last books I talk about and really help us think about the way in which when we're complicit in denying freedom, either to others or to ourselves, that th that leads to another kind of exis new existentialist novel, meditating on our own complicity and responsibility. But then we could end with a kind of flip side of the whole big question is, when would we think that existentialism might lapse completely into irrelevance? So one possibility would be if we decide that we're fundamentally unfree. And so I think the, the kind of most uh, pressing version of this possibility would be some people, some people think that uh, science has or is or will reveal that free will is completely an illusion and we're utterly deterministic creatures. Um, and if we, if we, as cultures and societies decides, decide that that's true, then this kind of core claim of existentialism that we are free, that we are responsible would no longer be tenable. Um, kind of more plausibly, I'd say that whether that we ever have a good, like a definitive answer to that question, existentialism will also lapse into a, ir irrelevance if we become totally complacent to our own freedom. So in particular, if we rationalize um, the unequal distribution freedom of the world. So if we, if we grant that, okay, some people have more freedom, others less, we all have some kind of basic freedom, but we don't care about actually achieving any sort of increase in freedom and equality. That would be another place where people would lose any kind of sense or relevance of existentialism. Um, but I think in both of those cases, it's also, those are the, exactly the kind of dystopics, dystopic portraits that I would imagine will always have dissenters. And so it'd be the people kind of standing in, in opposition to those reigning worldviews um, that would in particular emerge as caring about existentialism. Okay, sorry to, uh, I badly estimated my time on this one. So sorry to go over, but I'm happy to answer questions still. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for that wonderful uh, 
discussion and you i know you did take time but it doesn't matter i think we were all mesmerized and especially i think our scholars and students they have benefited indeed with the number of works that you have given because you know they would might probably want to read and if they do want to do some research i think this is a good beginning for them so i'm really happy with that and uh, even though i do uh, think that you know there were a um, couple of things that you had mentioned which are interesting enough like you know the question of the values and acts that uh, come up and also the notion of how crisis gives rise to maybe freedom and the question of how freedom is conceptualized and um, then also this uh, interesting uh, dimension where you were looking at uh, colonialism and the intersection with existentialism those were interesting points and uh, you know maybe sometime later i would uh, like to maybe email you and get some responses to those because there are quite a few questions and let me allow the participants to have their say today uh, we begin with kirti kumar ramanuj's uh, questions um, they he has three or four of them and uh, basically i think they're all if i want to, to put them together he has this question of uh, asking you as to how all the books that you mentioned become existential texts and uh, how would you know you uh, consider whatever is literary existentialism how do you actually define that or uh, conceptualize that and what would be the difference between something like literary existentialism and uh, maybe philosophical existentialism yeah so i think that it's actually a, a quite difficult question to say Look, what is our what is our criterion for deciding something is or is not an existentialist book? So I think one one thing we one way we could address that question is through kind of particular lines of influence. So I think that one kind of very literal way people will defend a, a book as existentialist is like has this author read Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir and Camus and displayed this influence of those things that we uh, all agree are existentialist at the core. Um, that's kind of a boring answer. I think uh, kind of uh, another way we might think of it is that um, there's this particular kind of uh, tone and sensibility that exists in a lot of existentialist texts. So remember at the I was talking uh, in the previous lecture about um, the way Sartre reacts against conceptions of existentialism in his lecture. And one of them is that people complain that existentialism is very kind of dark and pessimistic. Um, and he offers this rebuttal to say, no, it's actually very optimistic. But on the face of it, a lot of existentialist texts, that's true, that um, like, nausea is this extremely heavy book. Um, I think like Camus, The Stranger, and The Plague. Um, they have this, like, there's this sense in which, like, uh, one of, the, I think one of the most basic feelings of the existentialist sensibility initially is something like that you're set upon by the world. It weighs on you in a certain way. It's heavy, right? And so one thing I think that leads people to describe more recent novels as existentialist is when there's something of that feeling to them. So I think like that Marie Najaye novel that I ended with has that same sort of like very claustrophobic, solipsistic, um, Kafkian worldview to it, um, but I think if we if we were really going to try to defend a particular answer to what is the criterion, it'd be something like: Are they exploring these issues that we take to be really core to existentialism? So, are they explorations of um, freedom from a particularly subjective perspective? in which the individual actor is weighted with this questions of their freedom and their responsibility as conjoined to each other. So I, I think that that's what in particular with these books I've talked about, um, what really unites them is that we're thinking about what is it like to be an individual human person burdened with the question of one's own freedom and responsibility in the world. And it turns out that that, that sensibility can actually, like in, I was saying in the movie goer, it can actually have a more lighter comic feel to it, um, but still be um, dealing with those sorts of questions. And then the, the kind of last thing that was asked about this difference between, between kind of literary and philosophical existentialism. So I think it, 
But first, it's important to say I, one, one of the reasons many of us are interested in existentialism is that it's the place, I take it, where those two things come most thoroughly together in both philosophical history and literary history. It's where they really like almost become undifferentiable. And so the distinction really becomes one of like the mode of writing. So is a text written like being a nothingness or like the myth of Sisyphus as a treatise where the author is speaking in their own voice, addressing um, kind of abstract questions or is it written in the form of either taking on a particular narratorial persona or from a third person narrator perspective, focusing on the interaction between characters as um, that being the mode or more indirect communication. But of course, what's, what's wonderful about a lot of these texts is that they play with the lines between those. So being a nothingness is a treatise, but it includes um, these sections where Sartre, like in the, the Patterns of Bad Faith chapter, Sartre gives us this waiter who's just as memorable a character as any character in any of his novels. Or with Kierkegaard, you have him playing with the very difference between what is a fictional persona and what is speaking in his own voice by creating these pseudonyms as the authors of works in different parts of his works. And so that's certainly what appeals to me, uh, one of the things that appeals to me enormously about existentialism as it really transgresses the distinction between literature and philosophy. And at any particular moment, these authors will draw on a more philosophical mode of writing or a more fictional narrative literary mode of writing or a more essayistic mode of writing, whatever like allows them to do what they're trying to do. Thank you. And I think, you know, we now have lots of labels coming up. So the next question is uh, with regard to Graham Greene's novel, The Heart of the Matter and the question by Shilpa Shri. I think she's one of our students. She asks, is it a study in religious existentialism? Yeah, so um, first, I can't say too much. Uh, I, unfortunately, I have never read um, The Heart of the Matter. I've read very little Graham Greene, actually. That's, I, I don't know why. That's an oversight that I should correct. Um, but I, but he is certainly someone who um, scholars talk about in connection with existentialism. Um, and in particular, like your, uh, your question suggests, like, um, this particular um, religious line, so the kind of the role of the Catholic novelist in connection with these questions of the uh, strain or collapse of traditional ways of life and religiosity and how to kind of find meaning in the face of that. So I can't, can't say anything much in detail, but just say like, if you, if you go out and do a little research, I think you could quickly find some scholars that, that do offer you the kind of answers you're looking for with Graham Greene and existentialism. Um, one of our speakers uh, who had uh, given the talk on Kafka, she is interested in knowing Dr. Rosie Singh. She is interested in knowing whether you know American existentialism developed somewhat differently from the French, that is the European existentialism in terms, especially uh, when you look at literature probably. Yeah, I, I think that that's a fascinating question that people have not written enough about. Um, so in, for years in my head, I've kind of like started to sketch out what would the syllabus look like if you were teaching a literature class called something like um, American existentialism or like English language existentialism. That um, I do think that it, it develops in its own way. So one one reason for that would be um, you would have to go back and look at the way in which existentialism was kind of not very well understood initially in America. So like a lot of ex major existentialist works were not translated into English until, um, you know, like the 60s or 70s or even more recently than that. So very frequently people were kind of influenced by like secondhand, not exactly accurate ideas of existentialism instead of going to the text themselves. I think there's also weird in, weird kind of intersections between American culture and existentialism that um, 
like di different things we view as like central to American experience of kind of the, the absolute centrality of commercialism in that kind of post-World War II American culture is so much at odds with existentialism, but exactly because of that also creates the possibility of like really taking up those existentialist concerns in a place where they, on the face of it, don't fit. Um, but then also kind of concern other like core notions of American culture about kind of self-determination and the centrality of freedom. Um, they really do, at least on the face of it, fit with existentialism, though when you push into them, maybe it's a, two, it's a, it's a different conception of freedom. Um, and then finally, I think that the other kind of strand you would really have to trace in thinking through existentialism in America is that American culture is so thoroughly anti-intellectual. And so especially in um, the post-World War II period, like so philosophy had this, this core role in French culture that it has never had in American culture. Um, maybe like the closest you could come is to talk about people like Emerson and Thoreau and transcendentalism. But in the 20th, like later 20th century, American culture is deeply anti-intellectual. American literary culture, I think you would even say, if not anti-intellectual, is certainly anti-philosophical. And so uh, I think one reason a lot of Americans are drawn to existentialism is that there's nothing in American literature where you can read a novel that's overtly philosophical in the way that a novel like Nausea or like The Stranger is, where it's like very clearly doing philosophy and is willing to sacrifice the kind of verisimilitude of character interaction for much direct, more abstract, direct philosophical investigations. And so I think like in American fiction, if you were gonna teach something on American existentialism. I think you could teach people like Joseph Heller, um, a Catch-22 conception of absurdity, or Something Happens, another of his novels. Or you could teach um, people, like, of course, the ones I mentioned that I think are the most explicit, um, but like more popular figures like John Updike and like uh, the rabbit novels. So this, this figure kind of trying to escape from his life. But I think when you, what, what I find when I read those novels is they feel quite shallow compared to European philosophical novels, exactly because I think American writers are afraid of doing philosophy on the surface. Like we've been, uh, it's ingrained into the notion of American fiction that the, that's bad fiction. Like that's that's fiction when it's become didactic or become philo philosophical instead of doing what fiction is supposed to do. So that's to suggest that I think in American fiction, people do too much to try to maintain these lines between philosophy and fiction. Whereas what I was saying is that with existentialism, um, what I think is most interesting is the way in which those lines are done away with. Uh, we have, uh, you know, of course, uh, I'm sure that, you know, the feedback later on would be filled up, but uh, still we already have an appreciation here from Joya Selly, who says that, you know, she enjoyed the description and mention of the books and she appreciated the uh, addition to her reading list. But uh, the question she has is, could you elaborate a little bit on the woman destroyed? Yeah, so um, the, so one, one thing that the actual title story of that collection, I haven't really talked about, um, the one that's actually called The Woman Destroyed, um, it's, it's actually kind of a longer novella length story. And that's worth mentioning too, um, especially as a feminist work, that it's this, um, it's basically a portrait um, of one woman who is really like collapsing under the pressure of male domina dominated society around her. And so written in a much more uh, overtly experimental and modernist way than some of these other texts that I've been talking about. Um, but the, the story that I keep pointing to in that collection, um, the age of discretion in The Woman Destroyed, um, the, the basic shape of that story is that um, a, a uh, mother and father who are both academics and committed leftists in their politics have a son 
who up to the point of the story has been following in his mother's footsteps. Um, she, she writes books about like Rousseau and philosophers and um, the son is pursuing uh, a PhD and is going to kind of follow after her. But then he uh, abandons that course and takes a job as a cultural attache with the, the, the right-wing government of Charles de Gaulle. And so the parents feel betrayed by the son. And, and in particular, they think that he is under the bad influence of his fiance, um, who is more conservative and from a rich family. And they think that he is in bad faith, that he's deluding himself into thinking that his values have changed and that really he's deep down committed to their leftism and just uh, taking this job because it'll make his life easier. Whereas then on the flip side, the son claims that his values have genuinely changed. And remember that this conception of values under existentialism you can never like commit yourself to, for all time to a value. Like if I value something now, that's no guarantee that I will value it tomorrow or next month or next year. At every moment, my values are created by the choices I'm actually making. So he thinks he's changed his values and he thinks in kind of a counter charge of bad faith that his mother has always just projected her values on him and never allowed him to actually freely develop as an individual. And so what I what I absolutely love about this story is that it's fairly straightforward to talk about like where value comes from for existentialists or what bad faith is for existentialists. This kind of act of deceiving yourself into thinking you're not responsible for something when really you free freely were. Um, but where it becomes so much more complicated is where you then put it into motion in the real world and say, okay, instead of abstractly stipulating these definitions, what happens when we really talk about two characters with competing values interacting with each other? We make it even more complicated because they have a history and they have uh, ideas about their shared future and their family members. And we put a kind of third character also from the family into play with slightly different values, right? And so I think that it's such a good story for thinking about existentialism because it gives you a very psychologically convincing portrait of what it looks like when we take these questions on not utterly abstractly, but through a particular family in their real conflicts. Is it okay, uh, Ben, to have one or two more questions? Sure. Yeah, I think uh, Lino will be asking you the next two, three questions. Lino, take okay, over. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Ben, our next question is uh, from Dr. Kalplata. How do you explain the saying by Camel? I'm not an existentialist. Yeah, so... Um, like I, I quickly referenced in the lecture, that's, there's this infamous thing that like no one thinks of themselves as an existentialist. So Sartre is like kind of okay for the label with the label for a while, um, but even later in his career, he largely rejects it. Heidegger emphatically didn't count himself as one, and his letter on humanism is his kind of explanation for why. And Camus, who is also one of these founding figures of existentialism explicitly says, I'm not an existentialist. So part of it, I, I think the explanation is that Camus and Sartre had this break. So they had been um, close friends and intellectual comrades for a long time. They'd worked together on the newspaper. Um, and they have this falling out over the question of um, whether one should be a committed communist or not. Um, and so I think part of the explanation is a kind of banally biographical one that because the word existentialism is so closely associated with Sartre, um, that one, one, one thing is that Camus felt like, especially when he and Sartre broke and were no longer friends, that he had to move away from that. But then I also think that there, there's kind of more intellectual meat there too, is that 
if you construe existentialism quite narrowly as kind of Sartre's ideas about existence preceding essence and us freely creating ourselves, I think if you push into the particulars of the view, Camus has his own version. And it's different enough that if he wants to really, if Camus wants people to really understand his ideas as his ideas, instead of kind of uh, like twisting them to fit them into a preconceived shape, then it's better for them to say like, okay, take my ideas on their own terms, not through this label existentialism. And, and I think Camus is, his sense, I think there really is this kind of different sense of absurdity and different sense of um, sensibility in the two. That this is one thing I'd mentioned only very briefly in my first lecture, but I think that like Sartre just takes atheism as a kind of obvious starting place that he, like, I don't think the question of God bothers Sartre. I think he just doesn't think God exists, is not tempted to think that God exists. And so he just says, okay, there's no God. So what, how do we think through questions of value and morality without God? I think Camus is, Camus is also an atheist, but I think he still feels this lingering weight of the history and tradition of religiosity on how our thinking takes place. So I think he's, he still doesn't think God exists, but he still feels like what it would mean to like really lead a meaningful life. What that used to mean is like to lead your life in accordance with and in service to God across certain traditional ways. And that really secured the meaning of your existence. And so I think for Camus, there's this kind of anxiety that like, that's what would really do it, but we can't have that, but we still want that. So it's kind of the, the absurdity for Camus, it feels to me is the contradiction between you still think the only thing that would really give us meaning are these traditional forms of meaning paired with the belief that those are impossible and not available. And so I think there, like one reason why Camus would say he's not an existentialist is to really like get your head around that tension. You have to uh, kind of take his thinking on its own terms and not kind of start with Sartre or not, not force it into Sartrean notions. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ben. So due to shortage of time, we need to skip some of the questions, uh, but don't worry. Uh, we'll make sure we'll uh, answer all the queries through the mail. So the last question is from Bishan Kumar. In what aspect Heidegger's being in time affects Sartre's even when Heidegger converts its very formula of existentialism? Existence precedes essence. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Ben? Uh, Heidegger's being in time is an enormous influence on Sartre in particular and existentialism generally. And like the, the question points to this, this thing that is the kind of core slogan of existentialism, existence precedes essence, is actually a line from being in time. And um, so I take it that what the way you would explain this um, line of influence is that Sartre, when he's thinking through the shape of his early thinking, being and nothing, and writing being and nothingness, I think that um, Being and Time by Heidegger is the most important text and influence on him, but um, it's not clear that, so there's two ways you could say this. One, the kind of less charitable way to say it would be that um, Sartre doesn't actually understand being in time all that well. Um, and in particular, I think the thing that Sartre doesn't understand about being in time is how radically it departs from Cartesian notions of consciousness. So for Descartes, what we most fundamentally are is a subjectivity that is a pure mind, kind of, if we think of ourselves as trapped within our head. And then in the meditations, the question is, okay, what can we actually know about the external world by trying to build out? But what we really fundamentally are is a thinking thing. And 
the kind of uncharitable way to say is that Sartre takes the kind of a lot of the core ideas from being in nothingness, where Heidegger had really rejected that notion of Cartesian subjectivity and instead said what we most fundamentally are are embodied beings that move through the world within particular societies and cultures where all patterns of different practices and meaning have already been established before our birth that we're thrown into and forced to come to terms with. Is to take a lot of that stuff from Heidegger and translate it back into a Cartesian subjectivity. So to say like, okay, for Heidegger, meaning is fundamentally outside of us in the practices and rituals and histories that we're a part of. And Sartre says, okay, what if we take all that and put it back inside your head again? Right? The more charitable way to put it would be to say that, um, not that Sartre misunderstands Heidegger, but he wants to take certain things from Heidegger, but disagrees about the subjectivity. And so combines what he likes from Heidegger with what he actually wants to hold on to more than Heidegger about Cartesian subjectivity. Uh, but I, I do take it too that uh, Heidegger, uh, again, a person who rejects this label of existentialism, he's at his most existentialist in being in time. Um, but even there, to read Heidegger as an existentialist, so to be centrally concerned with this question of individual freedom and responsibility and creating value, is already to do quite a bit of damage to what Heidegger thought his most central projects were. So in, in Being in Time, the question Heidegger really wants to ask is, um, what is the meaning of being? He thinks that all of Western philosophy since the pre-Socratics has forgotten that question and instead just wanted to ask the question of what is this being or what's that being instead of what is what is being. And, and um, all of the analyses that Heidegger offers in Being in Time of anxiety or of being towards death methodologically are actually offered on the way towards trying to ask that much more grandiose question of the meaning of being. Um, and to take Heidegger as an existentialist is basically to do something like ignore that framing, ignore that question Heidegger is actually interested in, and just focus on some of the initial steps that he takes for their own sake. So instead of asking like, what does anxiety reveal about our relationship to being to just focus on anxiety and his analysis of it and how it differs from fear. Um, I think that's totally a totally valid kind of interpretive move to like be interested in a philosopher, but for things against their kind of further intentions. But that's also helps to explain why Heidegger so adamantly himself rejected existentialism because he thinks it's something like um, before uh, Sorry, I lost the, my train of thought there. Um, uh, that reason that Heidegger rejects existentialism is that uh, he doesn't want to focus on those uh, individual human questions, ultimately. Those are just a kind of uh, means towards a larger end for him. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Uh, before we move into the closing session, uh, there are a few announcements to be made. Over to you, Jay Prakash. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, there is a quick uh, announcement. Uh, as you all know that uh, tomorrow we are going to have our uh, last lecture in the international e-lecture series. And that is going to be on uh, Sartrean existentialism, the intellectual, the humanist, and the engage by Dr. Romy Borges from JNU. Please note that uh, tomorrow's lecture will be in French at 11.30 a.m. Indian Standard Time. I repeat, tomorrow's lecture will be in French at 11.30 a.m. And yes, uh, tomorrow we will be sending you a Google form via your registered email address after the lecture. And we request all of you to fill it as the same will be used to generate the e-certificate and for sending the links of the entire recorded lecture of this international lecture series. Please make sure you check your mails regularly. And now I would like to request Miss Harita, our PhD scholar, to propose the vote of thanks. Over to Miss Harita. Thank you, Jay Prakash. I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes. 
Yes, okay. Uh, good evening, all. First and foremost, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Benjro. Uh, both his lectures were equally extensive, enriching, and engaging. Uh, today's lecture, even more. Uh, today's lecture even more so because I think uh, his talk today has brought together all what we have discussed in the previous sessions and it has uh, tied it up all uh, really nicely and um, I would also like to uh, thank you for addressing all of these questions that have been raised and um, I, sh I should also actually thank Kalpra ma'am and Ritu ma'am for the strategic placement of these lectures because uh, Today we discussed some pertinent writers we did not discuss before and it was pertinent that we discussed them after discussing giants like Sartre, Camus and Kafka. So thank you Dr. Benroth, uh, Kalpana ma'am and Ritu ma'am. And once again, uh, I would like to formally thank Kalpana ma'am and Ritu ma'am for organizing this e-lecture, making it happen and keeping us uh, active and academically engaged, busy and happy uh, during these tough times. So thank you both. And I would like to uh, thank both um, Jay Prakash and Linu, who have been working relentlessly in the background to make this uh, e-lecture series happen. Thank you both. And next, I would like to thank Mr. Ganapati, who has provided us with all the technical assistance we needed and guided us through the technical glitch glitches which frequently arose. So we cannot thank him enough. Thank you, Mr. Ganapati. And, uh, <clears throat> Lastly, we would also uh, like to thank all the participants for all your interest, your patience and uh, the very interesting queries, the intriguing questions you raised today and on all the other days. So thank you everyone. Uh, like JP announced, uh, we'll have the last session of the lecture series tomorrow, which will be in French. Anyone who is inter interested can join in. So ho hope to meet you all there. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Ben. It was wonderful having you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Austin. Thank you, Austin. Thank you. Our pleasure having you with us. We'll settle over the questions. <laughs>